Thanks for coming, and I want to thank Richard for putting it after lunch. Um, you know why? Is because after lunch, you guys all, you know, he had a, a great morning where you had learned a lot of stuff, had a lot of things to think about, but then at lunchtime, you took a little cognitive break. And so you're refreshed, and you're fed, and you're happy, and you're going to be engaged with me, right? Good. Yes, excellent. So my name's Yolanda. You can read it here. If I forget, I'll look. Um, I am a behavioral economist. So what is behavioral economics? Oh, also, I'm nervous. I don't talk as much uh, in public. So if you see me taking Daniela's uh, recommendations, who spoke about public speaking earlier, breathing out and staying grounded and focused. And so that's all I'm doing, and I'm not actually having a stroke. Um, so a behavioral, uh, behavioral economics is a field of psychology that focuses on how we behave um, from an economic standpoint. And what I mean by economic standpoint is just how our behaviors are driven um, and how we make choices and decisions. So um, we have two uh, Nobel Prize laureates in the form of, uh, oh dear, Daniel Kahneman, um, who won it in... Uh, 80 something or other, and more recently... <gasps> His name is gone. Starts with a C. Can you help me, FB? No, 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 no. Anyway, uh, I'll think about it. I'll, I'll remember it about two o'clock in the morning when I'm no longer nervous. Breathe out, um, and uh, and I'll come and tell you all. Uh, so. What we do is we look at how we actually behave, um, and rather than how we think we behave. And we're, I'm going to go through and I'm going to take you through some examples um, uh, later on. Uh, there's a big enough group where we're going to break up into two groups, but because um, I think it will work better if we do it that way. So uh, as you can read, I do this to influence and try to help um, create sustainable, sustainable behavior. And I do that by looking at the reality of our behavior and finding compassionate, realistic, useful, and effective ways to, be, to achieve that particular type of behavior that I want to achieve. So I want to ask some people, how many of you carry a, a bag with you and throw things on the floor? Yeah? Great. Awesome. How many of you forget to take your bag out of your car, even though you could carry it with you? Yeah, only one. Wow, that's really good. How many of you have a reusable cup? How many of you forget to take your reusable cup? Ah, more people fess up to that one. <laughs> Excellent. So why are these um, changes in behavior so difficult? I mean, for crying out loud, these particular bags, it's so easy. Why don't we do it? Well, there's a couple of reasons why we don't do it. And when we first started, when the, the 10p um, uh, tax first came in, um, there was a lot of times where people would just walk in and go, oh, I forgot it, you know? But there was also a lot of times when people would get out of their car and see the sign as they were walking in that said, don't forget your bags. And I watched people go, oh, right, go back. In fact, I was one of those people more than once to go back and go get my bag. So why is this more successful than this? And I'm going to posit to you is that it's because of that 10p tax. If I had to go in and pay an extra surcharge, which a lot of cup, cup and coffee companies are doing now, is asking you to pay an extra surcharge on a disposable cup, that starts to change the behavior. And when you start to change behavior, you start remembering your previous behavior. And when you start remembering your previous behavior, you stop having to think about making a decision to change your behavior. And that is when behavior change happens. So what do I try to do? I try to help companies 
come up with ways of m messaging and showing how uh, you know, the behavior change that they are looking for in effective ways. Now, I'm an academic, um, and so I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I stand on several giants, but my, my favorite giants are the Behavioral Insight Team, which was uh, sometimes called the Nudge Unit, set up in 2010. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. They are, um, they, they have written a document um, on effective uh, messaging. And so I'm going to give you a, my, 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 my free advice here, advice freely given, whatever. Um, my free advice on when you have a message that you want to give out to a large number of people. I want you to remember the acronym EAST. You need to make it easy, accessible, social, and timely. Let me tell you my favorite example of this is it's the easiest one that I, that it's just a, a beautiful piece of messaging. Driving down the motorway, I see a works lorry. On the back of that works lorry is a great big red sign with white lettering on it. And it says, slow down, my daddy works here. Brilliant. Easy. All I have to do to slow down, take my foot off the accelerator. Attractive. Red background, white lettering, very few words. I can read it very quickly. Social. Nobody wants to kill anybody's daddy. Timely. I'm driving right by it. I'm right there at the, at the time. That's why the messaging to take your bags to the grocery store outside of the grocery store works so well if you're in the parking lot. Doesn't work so well if you've crossed the plane of the door. At that point in time, you're going to say, oh, it's only 10p, screw it. I'm not going to bother about it. That is why the coffee cup problem, issue, whatever, the, this is not as prevalent is because it's very hard to get this timely to message to you. You have to remember when you leave the house that you want to take your reusable bottle with you. So this is a, de a decision that you have to make earlier, but not when you're actually going to use it. Sometimes, you know, it's great if we remember. Sometimes we get to the coffee store and think, oh, darn it. Forgot it again. So that's a very short precy on behavioral economics. Anybody have any questions so far? Good. So as designers, as product designers, um, those who are extremely clever about these things have figured out ways to fit products to our body and how our body works. Chairs, for instance. iPods, which I think is a bit of a bone of contention from an earlier session. Um, cars, pens, shoes, you know, these, and when these things work well for us, we, um, you know, we, we use them and we enjoy the product. If they don't work well for us, then some Clever Clogs is gonna come around and figure out a way to make it work for us. Um, so the, the iPod example from an earlier session about, you know, there were MP3, solid state MP3 players out before the iPod came out, but the iPod was so slick and so easy to use, it changed that particular game. Of course, there's also discussion around the aesthetics of it, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, so products have been designed to make us like what, that what they do. They've also been very cleverly designed to make us not like what they do. So for instance, anybody ever been to Paris? Yeah? Anybody ever walked down and had a coffee in the middle, uh, you know, out on, uh, in, uh, out on the street and you're sitting there having a coffee and you've got your espresso and you're feeling ever so sophisticated and then you realize that your knees are neat, numb and that your feet have fallen asleep? It's because there's a two centimeter rim on the chair, and that intentionally has been designed to cut off the circulation in your legs 
So you want to get up and leave so that they can get another table in there. They're called 15-minute chairs. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so, you know, somebody, somebody, you know, the, your, the, the, the cafe owner, they want to get you out. You know, they want you to have your coffee, have a nice time very much, and, you know, come back again, but come back. You know, don't just sit here and spend two hours reading your poetry, you know, <laughs> and drink it, you know. So what we as behavioral economists do is we look at ways that we actually make decisions and we try to, well, I try to help um, sustainable or companies who want to change around sustainability uh, and, and help to change those kinds of behaviors. So I hear you say, what companies? Well, really quickly, I've got two main projects. One is about a reward for waste um, project that is using blockchain as a way of uh, making recycling more rewarding. And the second one is a company called uh, The Rubbish Cup. We have a fully recycled PET plastic cup that we use to, um, at, at festivals, uh, or it could be anywhere that you would use a single-use plastic cup. And um, we don't call it single-use plastic cup because we call it a circular economy plastic cup because after you use that, part of our product is we come back, we collect all those cups, take any other PET away from you, and create more plastic. And happy to talk more and more about that because it's really exciting. So I, um, so yeah, and he's still gone. I can't think of his name. The, uh, my other favorite researcher, well, no, my favorite researcher is a guy named Dan Ariely, who, uh, absolutely brilliant man. Loads and loads and, you know, the, the work that he's done, uh, I can only aspire to. Um, but he wrote this really great, well, he's written several books. One's called um, Predictably Irrational, um, which I shamelessly stole for my title of this talk. One is called uh, Small Change, and it's all about our money behavior. And then I can't think of the other one. There's something about, um, you know, why, why, you know, predictably, the upside of irrationality. That's what it is. But he's also written a game called Predictably Irrational. And this game takes the um, a research that he has done and a bunch of other researchers have done, behavioral uh, researchers, and um, gamified the research. So uh, I want to take you through some reasonably obvious ones that, you know, so give you the idea of the game. And then because there's so many of you, we're going to split the group in half. Um, and my, I'm going to ask my husband who, uh, to run one half, and I'll run the other half. Um, and we will play this game together, and we'll talk about the, um, the, the irrational behavior and, and what you think people should do versus what we actually do do. So this is how the game works. This one, this is called the Ten Commandments. Researchers, researchers asked some participants, participants to list 10 books they read in high school and others to list the Ten Commandments, or to the best of their memory. Afterwards, everyone performed a simple math problem and then got paid based on the number of correct answers. But the researchers asked participants to self-report the number of questions they answered correctly, which means that they could lie about their scores and get more money. Yeah? So the question is, how did writing down the Ten Commandments instead of writing down ten books from high school affect people's cheating habits? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so they cheated more. They cheated less. They cheated to the same degree. Overall, they cheated less, but this de decrease was due to the individuals who remembered the most commandments. So what do you think? Did they cheat more? The people who wrote down the Ten Commandments. Did they cheat more than the people who wrote down ten book titles, or less, or the same? 
So we've got more. We've got less over there. I heard someone say less. And I, I heard uh, a, a depends on how religious they are. Um, I don't have, who said the religious? I don't, I don't know that this re research well enough to be able to tell you whether or not they measured that. So um, I, I'm sorry to not be able to answer that one, but, or state that one. They, in fact, cheated less. So it is because they were, are reminded of these social norms, social mores. Whether or not you're religious, um, the Ten Commandments, you know, I, I know many people who are religious and many people who are not religious, and pretty much all of us think killing is a bad idea. Yeah? Yeah. So, um, so yeah? Pretty easy? Right. So, blind taste test. In this study, participants in, at a pub were given two samples of beer to taste and evaluate. One sample was regular beer, while the other was regular beer with a few drops of balsamic vinegar. Mm. They called this concoction the MIT brew. Can you tell where Dan O'Reilly went to? Yeah. Some of the participants were informed about this special ingredient before they had a taste, and others were clued in only after tasting both samples, but before making the choice of which they wanted more of. And finally, some of the participants were never told about the secret ingredient. Which group least preferred the MIT brew? The participants who never learned about the secret ingredient, participants who learned about the vinegar before tasting the beers, participants who learned about the vinegar after tasting their beers, or the participants who knew about the secret ingredient regardless when they found out? Four? Never? After? So we're all over the map there. Yeah? Yeah? So, <laughs> so the answer is the participants who learned about the vinegar before they tasted the beers. So this is tying into our expectations. If our expectations are, you know, this is going to be bland and boring, we're going to find it bland and boring. There's another one that I didn't choose here, but that's kind of interesting, um, about... Uh, uh, Lemonade. So participants were given either really weak lemonade, so mostly water with just a little bit of lemon and sugar in it, really strong lemonade, um, you know, lots of lemon, lots of sugar, uh, and sort of normal in the middle lemonade. And then they, they were given the opportunity to mix their own lemonade and, and switch it and, and, and change it as they wanted to. So of those group you know, the really weak, really strong, or just right people, who do you think was the group that experimented the most? Weak ones? Strong ones? Yeah? It's the Goldilocks ones. The Goldilocks ones said, ah, oh, this was fine. I don't need to, I don't need to make the changes. Somebody else made that decision for me. And that's part of the decision fatigue. That's part of a, yeah, what we call decision fatigue is everybody here has a limited amount of cognitive load to work with. Doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you have more, you have less, but we all have a limited amount. And so that Goldilocks ratio there said, oh, somebody else made this decision. I don't have to. And with these decision-making that we're trying to give out messaging to is we're trying to make the decision as easy as possible. Take your bag. Put the message, take your bag, in the car park where it's likely to be. The bag is likely to be in the car, in the car park, before you go into the store. Um, I, who am, you know, you would think I was good at this, this is my fail-safe. I have a really big bag here but it fits in my little purse. So I can carry my bags with me and not have to worry about where, you know, is it a large bag like this 
that sits in, in my car. So I have preloaded that decision. So I don't have to think about that anymore because it's in my bag. I don't have to think, oh, do I have my bags with me? Because it's in my bag. And let me tell you how mad I get when I don't have any bags in my bag. It's like, no, 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 I'm better than this. I put this away. <laughs> when we're making decisions, um, you know, we, we, like I said earlier, we have a limited amount of cognitive load. So um, decisions that are easy to make still impact your ability to make decisions. So if I came up to you and said, um, what would you like on your sandwich? Do you want white bread, brown bread, granary bread? Gluten-free, toasted, cheese, mayonnaise, mustard, onions? <laughs> um, all of these little decisions are going to are, are, I'm sorry, I've just impacted your cognitive load there. <laughs> you know? So don't try to make any big decisions later. No, I'm kidding. Um, the, the, but, but really, this is why uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg, President Obama, um, wear the same suit. You know, Obama jokes that he had two suits and one tux the entire time, whereas Michelle had to have an entire 18,000 different wardrobes because everything she wore was scrutinized, whereas everything he wore, he was like, no, I'm cool, you know, it's good. Um, but when you don't have to make little decisions. So uh, what I would like you to take away from this is a couple things. Um, one of them is when you want to change your behavior, um, obviously everyone knows you make little behavior changes, but the better thing to do, not better, but in addition to that is preload your decisions as much as possible. This bag goes in my bag. So I have a, I have a purse that I carry around. Now, what do you guys call them here? You don't like a, a satchel. Um, I have a satchel that I carry around. It has my wallet in it. It has my you know, lip balm in it, um, my keys sometimes even. And it has my bags in it. And that way I know if I am walking past the store, I can go into that store and I don't have to carry a bag with me. That makes me happy. My bottle here, guess what? It fits in my bag. And when I bought my bottle, I made sure it fit in my bag. And so therefore, I can never buy another bag because it has to fit in my bag. <laughs> my iPad, no, never mind. Um, so I preloaded as many decisions as I can um, so that I don't have to think about it. When we have, you know, when we're trying to save money, um, you know, I don't know. And, and here always have enough money at the end of the month so that they can just pop money into their savings account? Yeah, yeah, no, just there's so much left over. Some of us, you'll be really shocked to find out, some of us have a hard, harder time saving money at the end of the month. In fact, it doesn't happen. Um, but when we never see that money, then say in a 401k savings plan, it's just secretly sneaked away, but that's saving it for us. Because at some point in time, we all know that we're going to want to retire, whatever that means, um, and we're going to want to live a comfortable life. Um, and so that retirement plan, if we don't have to see it and make that decision every month, um, is going to help us achieve that goal. Um, when uh, you are, you know, I say you want to get fit. Um, how many people have or know people who have said, right, on Monday morning, I'm going to get up at four in the morning, I'm going to go for a run, I'm only going to drink water until 10 o'clock, and then I'm going to have a piece of lettuce, you know? And where are they at 10 o'clock on Monday morning? Donut, coffee, it's all good, right? But next Monday, next Monday, I'm going to make all these different changes. Um, but you don't want to make those big changes. Make little changes. Little changes until they are no longer part of your cognitive load. You no longer have to think about it all the time. Because when you think about it all the time, then you don't have the cognitive load to be able to think about anything else. And so therefore, you make the decision actually you know what, this problem I'm having at work, I need to think about that. And of course, we're going to need a coffee and a donut to be able to think about that properly. So.